Thank you very much, Mike. I'm pleased to be here, but I'm sombered by the grief which I, which I share, being a mother. But on the other hand, I'm deeply inspired to see the commitment and the passion and the energy of families and patients to make a difference and with strength and resolve to do always my best because this is not acceptable. We have to imbibe, put in our DNAs that till the time we achieve zero harm, we are not going to rest and it has to sustain at zero harm. There'll be new challenges coming to patient safety with new technology, new developments, but we have to keep that in mind. And in low and middle income countries where I come from, we are still very, very far when it comes to even simple procedures. Even the implementation of technology in day-to-day -day work is not available. Even paper-based records are not done properly while we speak about electronic health records. So we have a long way to go. But first of all, on a very positive note, my congratulations to Jokiani and the entire family of Patient Safety Women Foundation for the 10th anniversary of the foundation. <laughs> and also for the 10th annual World Patient Safety Science and Technology Summit. Major, major milestones, I must say. These are really important milestones. I believe that each summit which was organized by Patient Safety Movement Foundation actually spearheaded a global patient safety movement which has gone from strength to strength. And along with several key global initiatives, particularly the Global Ministerial Summits on Patient Safety, I also truly believe that these, this global patient safety movement which has been created has led to significant incremental improvements in patient safety and also now leading to transformative changes in safe, safety of healthcare systems in many countries around the world. In addition, I think there's more and more recognition of the huge burden and the problem which health systems are facing, which is the burden of harm in healthcare, which is avoidable, which is unnecessary, and totally unacceptable. Whenever we ponder over what is the problem and how big is the problem, we come across uh, estimates of the burden of harm, mainly uh, based on studies from high-income countries. However, we all recognize that patient safety is a global public health concern and it's a major challenge. The studies still coming from low and middle income countries are limited. And based on these limited studies, the estimates which have, we have from the literature is that every minute at least five patients die in low and middle income countries in the hospitals. So it is not incorrect to say that the burden of harm in healthcare is grossly underestimated. However, I think that actually the actual burden of harm is, is not quantifiable because these figures, they never capture, they never take into account the suffering of people and the devastation it causes in their lives forever. And, and something which did not need to happen, which could have been easily avoided, but caused disproportionate harm. As compared to if you look at the error or the unsafe medic practices, you might think it's not that serious, but it causes disproportionate harm to people's lives. When I was a medical student, I witnessed several incidents of harm uh, looking around in, the, in, in my teaching hospital. Somehow it appeared to me that harm in healthcare, those incidents appeared that it had to happen. They were like normal consequences of treatment. So back then, harm in healthcare was normalized, that it has to happen. 
but that should not be the situation, and that is not the situation. We have seen that the, since the beginning of the millennium, there has been patient safety movements, from the report to Aris Human to Organization with a Memory. There have been several initiatives around the world. And these initiatives, through extensive efforts of leaders, which are global patient safety advocates, champions, political leaders, and I would like to name few of them without whom this movement would not have been possible. Dr. Don Berwick, Sir Liam Donaldson, um, Dr. Victor Zhao, Sue Sheridan, Helen Huskell, Mr. Jokiani, and Mr. Jamie Hunt, and WHO DGs, Dr. Chan, and Dr. Ted Ross. But there are many, many others, everyone in this room and everyone who works on patient safety. They are contributing in their way to the global patient safety movement. And this has really changed, and it is, continues to change the scenario. So I have a couple of slides which I would like to share. So um, we all recognize that years of effort, particularly since the time the Global Ministerial Summit started, building on the momentum created by summits organized by Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and the, one I, the first one I attended was in London, where Dr. Tedros also joined. All of them have provided a very, very strong foundation for our global work on patient safety, unprecedented political momentum on patient safety, and that led to a watershed moment in May 2019, which saw the adoption of a resolution on patient safety, global action on patient safety, uh, and that also provided a very important launching pad for establishment of World Patient Safety Day and the Global Patient Safety Action Plan. Sue spoke about the, glo the Global Patient Safety Action Plan, so Liam also referred to it. This is something, again, a very historic a moment. The adoption of this action plan was a historic moment in May of 2021, when the 74th World Health Assembly adopted the, the resolution and the action plan. This, the global action plan actually is enshrined in the vision of a world in which no one is harmed in healthcare. So we speak of zero harm. No one is harmed in healthcare and every patient receives safe and respectful care every time, everywhere. And the vision also captures the, um, the level of harm which is to health workers also should be addressed. So it's encompassing patient safety and health worker safety. The action plan which was uh, developed, actually it is um, uh, a very important strategic framework for action which provides a global roadmap for action for next 10 years presented as a seven by five metrics, which there are seven strategic objectives which you see on your screen, and each achievable through five corresponding strategies for each of these strategic objectives, and then also proposed actions to be taken by all stakeholders and partners. This action plan has, um, the way it is presented, it's very comprehensive and has a systems approach to patient safety, that we will achieve a zero harm in healthcare, which is the title itself is towards eliminating avoidable harm in healthcare, a vision for next 10 years, a roadmap for next 10 years, through these seven key strategic objectives, which is firstly having policies to eliminate avoidable harm in healthcare, a mindset of zero harm, high reliability systems, safety of clinical processes, patient and family engagement as a pillar and a foundation health worker education, skills and safety, information research and risk management, and finally, synergy, partnership, and, um, and uh, solidarity. WHO has been in the forefront of the global patient safety movement and has launched uh, to align with the global patient safety action plan and as part of WHO's response to the global call for action, a flagship initiative, which is the decade of patient safety, 2021 to 2030. And um, there are several programs, the key streams of work which we are undertaking as part of this flagship initiative. First and the foremost, the establishment of World Patient Safety Day. So facilitating global advocacy and also catalyzing change through campaigns for World Patient Safety Day 
annually on 17 September. Implementing and monitoring progress of the Global Patient Safety Action Plan through development of tools and guidelines, as well as country support. Designing and implementing global patient safety challenges, and the current challenge which is ongoing is on medication without harm. And in addition to um, giving strategic guidance to countries, we are working on several tools as well to support countries in working towards medication without harm. And uh, it was presented this morning that um, the error which actually led to Justine's death was the look-alike, sound-alike medication. So we are working on, in very um, near future, we are going to launch guidelines on how to prevent look-alike, sound-alike medication errors. Mike mentioned about global patient safety collaboratives, so um, providing country support and building capacities through a pioneering model initiative co-led by UK government and WHO with Imperial College London as the academic partner. Strengthening the global patient safety network, and now this global patient safety network is also expanding to include several regional networks as well as sub-communities on specific theme-based networks as well, bringing together experts and patient representatives. Patients for Patient Safety Network also is within the umbrella of global patient safety network, providing opportunity to patients and families and health workers who are committed to uh, patient family engagement to contribute to this discussion and interactive forum. Also uh, developing um, technical tools and guidelines, uh, reporting and learning in particular, um, safety culture we are working on, education and training, leadership competency framework. We also, um, as earlier mentioned, implications of the COVID pandemic on pa for patient safety. So several of these tools and guidelines uh, and development is one of our core stream of work as well. And finally, and most importantly, uh, working for engaging and empowering patients, particularly through the Patients for Patient Safety Network, and also working very closely with patient organizations. So when the uh, uh, resolution on action, pa action plan for patient safety, um, global action on patient safety of 2019 was adopted, one of the key actions which was uh, asked to member states was to integrate and implement patient safety strategies in all clinical and safety programs so that we could prevent avoidable harm which is related to healthcare procedures, products, and devices. And to support this initiative, to support the countries in implementing this particular action to integrate patient safety and implement patient safety strategies in clinical programs. We are now working across health systems and specific safety, health, and clinical programs. And we've created agile teams, which bring together the specific programs as well as the, uh, the health system programs. So we are bringing together the sub subject matter experts knowledge and profound understanding of systems and looking into solutions and how to integrate patient safety strategies in all these programs on immunization safety, medication safety, blood safety, and several others. And, and coming from a blood transfusion safety field, I realized it was extremely important because on one hand, it was actually contributing to reduction of harm at the point of care through clinical and safety programs. And on the other hand, it was supporting the efforts for health system strengthening. So this is the science of patient safety improvement, which are now uh, implementing through the flagship initiative. Monitoring and reporting is one of the key component of the Global Action Plan. When the World Health Assembly in, uh, in 2021 was adopting the Action Plan, they also asked WHO to report on its progress every two years until 2031 aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals. So just last Friday, the World Health Assembly, the 76th World Health Assembly, considered the first progress report, which was presented by WHO, based on a first ever member state survey on patient safety, and, and we were able to collect uh, responses from 102 countries, and an interim report was pr uh, produced. And we are also working on a very comprehensive global patient safety report to be launched la later this year. And you can see the progress on the 10 core indicators, which are part of the action plan, and just want to sh uh, share two or three of them. 27% countries report that they have national pol policies and action plans. And only 18% countries have actually established their national targets 
for reduction in medication-related uh, harm. Um, and th that, um, particularly for the patient-family engagement, it is still the beginning. Only 13% countries actually have reported that they have a patient representative in majority of the hospitals. So more than 60% hospitals have a patient representative, only 13 countries in a way, because 102 countries reported. Very, very, uh, such as uh, really at the beginning and a long way to go in this. So um, Sue mentioned about patient engagement. And I think we really need to actually look into how we deliver care differently. This, the health systems are facing several challenges and the questions which arise are, can we create a paradigm shift in how healthcare is provided? And can we eliminate all avoidable harm in healthcare? The answer is yes, we can. We can by developing systems and protocols and procedures to reduce the risk of harm and also when harm happens, reduce its impact on patient. We need to innovate. We need to find solutions which are um, working at local level. We have to work with partners at local level to see what really works. So we need to innovate so that it's not necessary that we need to do different things, but we need to do things differently so that we can address the challenges of, of um, health systems in providing safe care. So this year, World Patient Safety Day is dedicated to um, engaging patients for patient safety because we realize that when patients are treated as partners, there are significant gains in safety, in patient satisfaction, as well as health outcomes. So we want to give center stage to patients' voice and elevate the voice of patients and the slogan for this year. We are really inspired by people who actually are coming forward to share their stories of an experience of how they brought about change for safer care. And we are having this initiative now to collect patient stories and experience in, in healthcare. And we would like to engage all of you in this initiative. So to conclude my talk, the WHO resolution clearly states that health is one of the fundamental rights of every human. Acknowledging that the right to health is a, is a uh, health is a human right, WHO elaborates that access to healthcare is also a human right because until unless you have access to healthcare, how will you ensure that uh, health is a human right? But it's very critical that we acknowledge, and I want to, to quote uh, Dr. Tedros, that if it is not safe, it is not care. So we have to acknowledge that access to safe healthcare is a human right. It's really, really important. So while we are at the 10th summit dedicated to first do no harm, we have to reiterate that first do no harm should be a foundation of every health system, particularly when we are building resilient health systems based on the lessons of COVID-19 and we are, you know, we are look, investing into health systems, strengthening and, and developing resilient systems. First do no harm should be the foundation of any healthcare system. So with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you.